Hello, everybody. This is Trevor Cully, host of the History of Persia podcast. From about 550 to 330 BC, most of the Middle East was ruled by the Achaemenid Persians. The Achaemenids pioneered the concept of a truly multinational empire that incorporated people from as far away as India and Greece under the banner of one empire for over 200 years. The story of Persia discusses the fall of ancient civilizations, the origins of endurance racing, 300 Spartans, the March of the 10,000, and at least one evil priest who replaced and impersonated the king all before the Achaemenids came to a dramatic close with the story of being on the losing end of Alexander the Great's conquests. If that story and the cultures that surround it sound interesting to you, check out the History of Persia at historyofpersiapodcast.wordpress.com or wherever you find your favorite podcasts, like this one. On September 29th, 1729... Just to the east of Memandust, a small village in northern Iran, the first glimmers of morning light began filtering through the surrounding mountainous landscape. Shedding light on the massive sea of 40,000 cavalry located in the wide and ancient mountain valley below, the army of Shah Ashraf Hotak, the ruler of Iran, whose predecessor had seven years prior ended the 220-year reign of the Safavid dynasty. This imposing force, headlined by his fearsome Afghan Gelzai warriors, distributed into three large divisions positioned across the width of the valley, with their standards gently flapping in the gentle morning breeze as they awaited the arrival of their adversaries. At first, a low nondescript rumbling coming from the east, with clouds of dust being kicked up in the distance. But soon, unmistakable. Thousands of footsteps marching over the dry ground, the echoes of their approach bouncing off the highlands that followed adjacently along the mountain valley path en route to Memandust. The soaring peaks of the Alborz mountain range to the north, and the much lower, eroded slopes marking the start of the vast desert to the south called the Dashti Kavir, which lies in the middle of the Iranian plateau. The marching footsteps, coming from the 25,000 strong army of Tamast II, a prince, now self-proclaimed king of the Safavid line, that was attempting to reclaim his family's empire. A cause that against tremendous odds had been gaining in momentum. According to rumors, largely owing to the hulking commander-in-chief of his army, Nader Koli Beg, recently entitled Tamas Koli Khan, meaning slave or servant of Shah Tamas. A reportedly bold general, who proving true to his reputation, now had the nerve to audaciously challenge the Afghan army in a pitched battle. This, despite being outnumbered heavily, and in particular, far eclipsed from a cavalry standpoint. The Persian horsemen topping out at a mere 8,000, with the bulk of the Safavid strength resting on the shoulders of its musket-bearing infantry, and a surprising number of field artillery pieces that were laboriously being dragged behind them. The appearance of the Safavid army causing the supremely confident Ashraf Hotak to offer up a sarcastic quip to his nearby officers stating that they should in fact be thanking the Safavid general for leading them here, since this would save them the trouble of having to hunt them down in the mountains, which elicited a laugh from his men. Followed by another bout of amusement, when the Persians launched several thousand cavalry forward, somewhere between four to five thousand, aiming towards the extreme left of their forty thousand opposing counterparts. The intention of the opening Safavid thrust quickly dawning on Ashraf, that this was intended to cover the retreat of their infantry, knowing that his superior numbers and his Galzai mounted warriors would have easily ran them through. His assumptions validated when scouts reported in that the majority of the Persian army had marched back and then veered south away from the Afghan line, while the Persian cavalry was being chased down by vastly larger Afghan contingents all across the mountain valley, 
like disturbed bees, creating a chaos of motion and movement. All of this being, in fact, an elaborate diversion, unfolding exactly as Nader had planned, buying the valuable time he needed to achieve the setup he desired, aiming to squeeze every last ounce of benefit from the landscape, bellowing at his infantry and artillery to rush towards the base of the lower-lying hills in the southern portion of the valley, pointing to the elevations where his cannons and mortars were to be pulled up to, requiring immense sweat-inducing strain and effort, and to where his musketmen would make their stand. And as Ashraf Hotak would soon come to realize, most certainly not a retreat, but rather a masterclass of tactical strategy. And once all was in position, Nather sounding the order to have his attacking horsemen melt away from the battlefield. The morning breezes slowly blowing the dust from the cavalry skirmishes aside to reveal the Safavid forces, unmoving and at the ready. Four divisions of musketmen arrayed along the base of the southern hills, with field cannons and mortars behind higher up in the hillsides, all pointing towards the path that the Afghans would have to take to reach them. Welcome to the Warlords of History podcast. I'm your host, Mark Pimenta. Part 3 of the series exploring the lifetime of Nader Shah, a name that in all likelihood wouldn't come to mind when one is asked to list off the greatest military commanders of history. But given what I've learned so far, solidified by what we'll be covering in this episode, it's quite certain that I'll be adding him to any of my future lists. A spot deserved by this self-taught, brilliant military strategist and tactician, who won countless battlefield victories throughout his career, many of these being unlikely successes slashing through both tradition and foes, with the odds rarely stacked in his favor, propelling and elevating his personal status into the stratosphere, far beyond the expected bounds that his insignificant lineage should have allowed him to ascend to, all the way to the top in fact, to later assume control of a chaotic and fragmented Iran in 1736, reviving reuniting and refashioning his nation into an intimidating militaristic state, reclaiming the lands it had previously lost and then expanding its domains at the expense of the various entities within and without the empire that had earlier almost succeeded to erase Iran off the map entirely. And while 1736 is indeed associated with the official date of his ascendancy to the Iranian throne, as we'll soon find out, unofficially, Nader's rule began from a much earlier point. However, before we go further here, it's time for a shout out, because I have the deep honor of welcoming Luke G as the newest addition into the ranks of the Warlords of History Immortals. Thank you for supporting my work and efforts through the Warlords of History Patreon page and for helping to cover the costs associated with making this podcast happen. Alright, let's get to it. As mentioned, this episode forms the third part of an ongoing series on Nader Shah, meaning that the overall sequence of events in the context of this installment will be much clearer if you have a listen of parts 1 and 2 first. However, here's a quick recap to help understand the state of affairs or jog your memory as to where we had last ended up, which was under the darkening shadow of an Iranian or Persian empire that was being ripped apart at the seams, hurtling towards imminent collapse, this descent hardly being registered by its oblivious Safavid monarchs, a once mighty dynasty of kings that had degraded into a series of lackluster and ineffectual leaders preoccupied with court intrigues and the pleasures of the royal harem, habitually neglecting the administration of their empire and the fighting readiness of the royal army, both of which were falling into a dismal state, laying down the ideal structure 
for a relatively minor Afghan Gelzai tribal rebellion stemming from Kandahar to gain momentum and transform into a massive regime changing movement. In 1722, toppling the 220 year rule of the Safavids from the helm of the Iranian Empire and establishing the Afghan Hotak dynasty. With foreign heavyweights like the Ottomans, Russians, and Uzbek Khanats then piling on, throwing their substantial weight around to take over parts of Iran for themselves. And that had also emboldened another Afghan tribal people, the Abdali, to launch a bid at carving out a kingdom of their own. Having conquered Herat from the Safavids in 1716, and from this base of operations, campaigning into Khorasan to attempt adding to their domains. This event in particular, leading to the young and ambitious Nader being pulled into the chaotic maelstrom, fighting under a series of Safavid governors in Khorasan's defense, performing exceptionally well in the slog of unending conflicts, but regularly overlooked for promotion due to his lowly heritage. Igniting Nader's fierce temper, who eventually established himself as a rogue warlord in Khorasan, one of the many that had popped up in the region, all tangled up in a web of entities vying for control, lasting until 1726, when a renegade Safavid prince by the name of Tamas II, after having proclaimed himself king, arrived in Khorasan, taking the initial steps to reclaim his birthright, the Iranian Empire. Nader jumping onto this opportunity to enter Tamas's service and quickly prove himself indispensable to the Iranian Shah in exile. Headlined by Nader conceiving a plot to conquer the city of Mashhad in a bloodless takeover, and shortly afterwards, followed by his engineering of a stunning victory over the Abdali Afghans at the Battle of Sangan in 1727, although outnumbered almost three to one, taking a novel approach, relying heavily on musket-bearing infantry to inflict heavy casualties and convincingly rout the force of 20,000 Afghan cavalry that had been attempting to squash them into submission, as they had successfully managed to do against numerous Safavid armies in previous years. Bringing us to where we had last left everything off in part two, with Shah Tamasp having rewarded his capable servant, promoting Nader to commander-in-chief of the Safavid army in late 1727, followed by a strained relationship that soon developed between servant and Shah, arising due to two main factors. 1. Tamas being raised in and consequently being the product of a toxic, drama-filled and intriguing royal court in Isfahan, meaning that favorable opinions of his subjects could on a whim, turned to suspicion, accentuated by the whisperings of other royal advisors that were growing jealous of the immense power that Nader had gained. And secondly, with some of the tense relationship attributed to Nader's conduct, a loud self-advocate who made it no secret that he and no one else had been the keystone to the Shah's recent successes at Mashhad and the Battle of Sangan. Made worse, by Nader's refusal to accept Tamasp's demands to promptly march on Isfahan, arguing that the Afghan Abdali tribe, although recently dealt a significant blow to their expansionistic desires, remained a definitive threat that needed to be wholly dealt with first. Along with other warlords and resistors remaining in Khorasan that still needed to be subdued. Otherwise, they would risk losing their base of operations, now the city of Mashhad, while attempting to liberate Isfahan, the capital of the Iranian Empire. Despite his protests, Shah Tamas begrudgingly yielding to his general's way of thinking, with Nader calling for a renewed campaign south from Mashhad into the Abdali Afghan domains to capitalize on their recent successes, this time aiming towards the heart of their fledgling kingdom, the city of Herat, in modern northwestern Afghanistan. Nader drawing up a plan of attack that would see them free up a larger proportion of their total troop count, estimated at 30,000 in and around Mashhad, for this new campaign, 
around 20,000 soldiers that would be evenly split between Tamas and Nadar, each leading their groups southwards, taking different paths, clearing out some smaller Abdali forts along the way before converging and reuniting at Herat to strike the final death blow to the Abdali ambitions. Both Nadar and Tamasp, at the head of their respective forces, marching out from Mashhad in early 1728. In a few short days, however, as Nadar made his way south, learning, to his surprise, that Tamasp had deviated from the plan, heading west from Mashhad instead of south. You see, Tamasp, aided by the other prominent advisors within his orbit, concerned with Nadar's growing influence, had been working behind the scenes to procure a series of military allies in Khorasan, with the goal of tipping the scales of this power struggle in their favor, all of whom were now being called upon to gather at Tamasp's side, at a city called Sabzavar, 250 kilometers west of Mashhad, in order to reassert the Shah's authority and his demands to march directly on Isfahan. But this also being a test, a test of loyalty and obedience that his new commander-in-chief was also being subjected to, commanded to scurry to his king's side or be branded as a traitor. Nather, agreeing to do so, but clearly understanding that the sands were shifting under his feet, threatening to swallow him whole if he were to bow to the whims of his unstable king, who might even go as far as to execute him and this was something that Nader was unwilling to risk to chance. On the surface, agreeing to Tamasp's demands as would a faithful servant, immediately abandoning his campaign towards the Abdali domains, but now with a different motivation driving his urgent march back to Mashhad. In that, there was no time to lose. He had to reach Sabzavar before Tamasp's newly gained allies where instead of using this as a brief stopover en route to promptly appear to the summons of his shah, what happened in Mashhad upon Nader's arrival was his crossing of the veritable Rubicon, in short, a military coup of the highest order. Nader immediately taking firm control of Mashhad and all the available Safavid forces located there and in the surrounding area, demanding their loyalty imprisoning or executing anyone that dared to question his authority, while promoting those in his command, his most trusted and talented soldiers, those that had been with him since his days in Dargaz and during his five-year tenure as a warlord, into the upper echelons of his army, including his younger brother Ibrahim, who had accompanied Nader throughout the majority of his exploits thus far, and that Nader left in charge of Mashhad in his absence. All of this business done swiftly and with ruthless efficiency, because Nader had indeed settled on meeting up with Tamas bin Sabzavar, but under different circumstances and with very different objectives than what his impertinent king and advisors were anticipating. Who by this point became aware of the changing situation in Mashhad, and that for all intensive purposes were now at war with the Safavid commander in chief. And while, unfortunately, sources don't give us much detail on the comparative sizes of the armies that Nader and Tamas had at their disposal, what we do know is that Nader managed to conclude affairs in Mashhad, add the bulk of the troops stationed there to his army, and reach the fortress at Sabzavar at a dizzying pace, most importantly, arriving there before a number of Tamas's largest allies. Nader wasting no time in setting up an impromptu siege and commanding his cannons to begin battering away at Sabzavar's fortifications, an assault that days in came under pressure from the outside due to the arrival of a large force of Kurdish tribal warriors in the low thousands who were intent on breaking the siege and joining with Tamas, that Nader's scouts caught wind of allowing the slippery commander to concoct a ruse to deal with their approach, luring the Kurdish force through a mountain passage to the north of Sabzavar, offering a path to the besieged city that the Kurds took, but then followed by the realization that they had walked into a trap. 
surrounded by segments of Nather's awaiting army, some lying in ambush along the ridges of the valley, and others that moved in to block the exits. Resulting in Nather not ordering the destruction of his disadvantaged adversary, but rather using this powerful position as leverage, successfully convincing the Kurdish leaders to join with him instead, before altogether resuming the siege of Sabzavar, leaving Tamas with few options but to raise the white flag of surrender. Nader entering the partially destroyed fort alongside a heavy guard, finally standing before Tamas as the Shah had desired, but with his servant holding all the cards. In the negotiations that followed, negotiations meaning what Nather commanded Tamas to do at the cost of keeping his crown and the head that supported it, this included Tamas publicly rescinding any claims of Nather being a traitor and promptly restoring him to the official position as commander-in-chief of the entire Safavid army and gifting Nather the entire region of Khorasan as his personal fiefdom, along with future claims, after cleared of enemy occupiers, to the province of Mazandaran, situated along the southern coast of the Caspian Sea in central north Iran, and the province of Kerman in southeastern Iran, land grants that would make Nader the most powerful figure in the empire once fully reclaimed from the Hotaks. With Nader then isolating his shah politically, forcing Tamas to dismiss his inner circle of advisors, filling these positions with men selected by the commander-in-chief. In the end, leaving Shah Tamas with little more than his title and a small part of his dignity left intact, stripped of all actual authority and held as a virtual prisoner, under the close supervision of guards that Nader was able to trust rendering a complete reversal of the dynamics between servant and shah. This point in early 1728, marking the elevation of the 40-year-old Nader to shah in every which way but name, with Tamasp as his servant, his puppet, granting Nader the freedom to act with royal legitimacy and to determine what the royal objectives were to be going forward. And really, there could be no going back now, as Nader would have been acutely aware that if not in absolute control, with power somehow transitioning back to Tamas or some other Safavid noble, that his fate would be sealed, surely executed. In the same breath, also knowing that due to his meager lineage, there was no way that he was going to be accepted as king by the most influential groups of Persian society lacking the God-ordained right to rule that those of the Safavid bloodline possessed. So while Nader may have been concerned that Tamas might still be able to stir up some trouble for him, he needed to keep him alive, under his direct control, and from falling into the hands of any ambitious rivals, using Tamas as a farmer would a tool to sow the seeds of his future legitimacy. Otherwise, risk seeing his newly established support disappear from under him, also preventing him to enlist the aid of other Safavid loyalists to regain the Iranian empire from the Hotaks. And while it's doubtful whether Nader knew exactly the path through which this would come to fruition, I tend to lean towards the idea that his plotting mind would have been regularly wrestling with this conundrum, on how he could eventually cast Tamas beside. Granted, one thing is resoundingly clear, that the timing was simply just not right at this point. And so, for now, through the balance of 1728, Nader contented himself with asserting his authority, getting Shah Tamas to rubber stamp any of his decisions, while setting off on campaign, of course dragging Tamas along, wherever the commander-in-chief went. Leading the Safavid army, estimated at 20,000 strong into northern Khorasan, to re-establish control over the region in the name of the Shah, reduce the remaining warlords to subservience and deal with a renewed wave of Uzbek raiders that had been causing havoc in Astarabad, the homeland of the Qajar tribe, that you may recollect from the previous episode, still accounted for a large proportion of the troops. This being another wise calculation devised by Nader, 
demonstrating his commitment to causes that were important to his troops, protecting their homeland as a way to bind them closer to his will. The overwhelming size and strength of the army, led by this astute general, easily allowing Nader to sweep these disturbances aside and assert control over northern Khorasan. And from there, march west into the neighboring region of Mazandaran, still under the control of the Russians since the conclusion of the Russo-Persian War in 1723 that we touched on in the last episode. But interestingly, only occupied by a minor presence of Russian troops, who were mostly relying on mercenaries from the nearby Caucasus region to hold it on their behalf. Proxy forces that Nader's army utterly crushed, not reconquering the entirety of the region, but specifically reaching as far as the city of Amal, Nader being careful to act with restraint concerning any Russian governors or forces encountered, sending them home rather than ruthlessly putting them to the sword, so as to not draw too much attention and reignite hostilities with Russia, since he clearly had more than enough on his plate already. Though, in part, certainly helped by the Russian Imperial Empire being distracted, struggling under internal succession issues following the death of Peter the Great in 1725. Nader's conquest of the eastern half of Mazandaran, then followed by the regular cadence of summoning Tamas from the shadows, who was reduced to living his new life as a figurehead, a show pony, told when and where to appear thereby legitimizing Nader's conduct and hold on the territories recently reclaimed, gaining acceptance among the Persian inhabitants and local leaders. And of note, while not explicitly stated in historical accounts, I'm convinced that a huge part of the motivation in heading into Mazandaran, specifically capturing the city of Amal, was strategically based since Amal was a major center of armament production in Persia, an exceptional source of artillery and smaller firearms. Evidenced by the words of Jonas Hanway, a British contemporary of the time who later said this of the city after visiting there. Due to the abundance of iron ore mines, by the order of Nader Shah, Amal became the most important foundry and steel plant, where cannons, cannonballs, rifles, and horseshoes were produced. This aligning with Nader's goal of aggressively rebuilding and modernizing the Persian armed forces, exploding the number of firearm-bearing infantry under his command, essential for expanding his military system structure, centered around a large corps of musketmen, supported by artillery, all guarded by cavalry on the flanks. Because, you see, Ever since Nader's initial exposure to gunpowder weapons during his early days in the service of Baba Ali Beg in Dargaz, as covered in Part 1, combined with his experiences in battle against the Abdali when under the service of Malik Mahmud Sistani, as covered in Part 2, understanding that the Afghans were fielding superior cavalry than what the Safavids were able to muster, this had great influence in driving Nader to develop the aforementioned tactical solution, centered around firearm-bearing infantry. And come to think of it, this is similar to what we learned of Philip II of Macedon in the last series, and how he developed the Macedonian phalanx to act as the backbone of his army in the 4th century BCE. And ever since being promoted as a general in Tamasp's service, Nader loudly arguing his belief, this eventually convinced Tamasp to spend the lion's share of the plunder they had acquired on arming more and more of the Safavid troops with muskets, instead of trying to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with cavalry-focused adversaries, but using inferior cavalry units. Sounds logical, right? But it wasn't exactly so simple. Because while musket-bearing infantry could be effective against cavalry-focused adversaries, let's face it, it must have been tremendously difficult for a soldier to remain composed and focused on the cumbersome process of reloading a musket, with a mass of charging and screaming horsemen bearing down on them. That is, unless extensively and relentlessly trained and drilled. So much that, it would become second nature 
or an almost automatic process for the soldier in question. A theory that became proven in practice against the Abdali at the Battle of Sangan in 1727, resulting in Nader's steadfast confidence in this system. Firearm infantry acting as the backbone of his army, around which to position artillery, supported by a dynamic cavalry used to guard the flanks, bolster hard-pressed infantry when needed, and charge out when appropriate. And now, since Nader, for all intents and purposes, was in full control, through 1728 onwards, he spent most of the acquired plunder to rapidly expand his military system. This, while subjecting his troops to a punishing training regiment, and all of this happening as he led his army through northern Khorasan and into Mazandaran, making sure that they were always well provisioned in the process, sparing no expense in this pursuit, even at the expense of the local inhabitants, never hesitating to take their food stores to ensure that his soldiers remained fed. Now they're using this period to introduce innovations as well, one of the most impactful being the development of an elite class of infantrymen, called the Jazayerchi, that neither himself would consistently lead in battle. Whereas there already existed the Tofangchi, meaning the regular infantry, that were armed with muskets, also carrying a curved Persian sword called the Shamshir as their melee weapon for close quarter combat, these units increasingly accounting for the bulk of Nader's forces, the very best of the Tofangchi were henceforth selected to fill the ranks of the Jazayirchi, named for the unique flintlock muskets that they were given, called the Jazayir, a powerful firearm that was of a much heavier caliber than its regular counterparts. Weighing a ponderously heavy 40 pounds compared to the 10 pound regular muskets, therefore more cumbersome to fire and reload, in fact, requiring a wooden tripod for the operator to keep it held aloft, since it couldn't be held or fired from the shoulder. Drawbacks that in the hands of the right troops could be outshined by its notable benefits, providing significant advantages in terms of firing range and accuracy, while also heaving much heavier caliber ammunition across the field. But only effective if the soldiers were masters of their craft with Nader demanding his entire body of troops would not on march to engage in hours upon hours of training per day, reportedly brutally intensive regiments of drilling and training, whipping his troops into shape and instilling the much needed discipline that the Safavid armies had been lacking for so long. The commander in chief being quick to promote troops based on merit, but also reportedly quick to punish sometimes to the penalty of death for major offenses. And to give us a flavor of what this training looked like, we have the words of a Greek historian by the name of Basil Vatatzis, who left behind an eyewitness account of his observations. The infantry, I mean those that carried muskets, would get together in their own units and they would shoot their guns at a target and exercise continuously. If Tamas Kulikan saw an ordinary soldier consistently on top form, he would promote him to be a leader of a hundred men, or a leader of fifty men. He encouraged all the soldiers towards bravery, ability, and experience. And in simple words, he himself gave an example of strong character and military virtue. The Jazayerchi, in particular, being the elite warriors that they were, also trained as a dynamic force, capable of fighting as mounted troops with lances and shamshirs. Though one problem with highlighting all the changes being made by Nader is that this foundational revamping of the Persian army was being initiated at this time, an undertaking that would continue to evolve throughout the course of his career. As such, at this early stage, it's difficult to pinpoint the exact breakdown of Nader's roughly 20,000 troops. But the overarching takeaway remains, the army was most certainly being reorganized, modernized with gunpowder weapons, and undergoing merciless training. And always, always paid on time, no matter what. In fact, neither being adamant about issuing payment to the troops by his own hand. 
because Nather understood that his position was only as secure as his hold on the military, maintaining their loyalty, especially for what was to come. An incredible sequence of strenuous battles waged in an astoundingly short period of time. Landing back at the city of Mashhad in February 1729 from the successful campaign in northern Khorasan and Mazandaran, and immediately making preparations to re-engage the Abdali Afghans. Ordering more infantry to be recruited and trained in Mashhad for future use, before marching out at the head of his force of 20,000 soldiers in early May 1729 towards the heart of the Abdali kingdom, the city of Herat, 600 kilometers away to the southeast. Of course, also dragging Shah Tamas along with him to keep him from causing any trouble. However, by this time, due to the interlude of Nader and Tamas squabbling with one another, and Nader's subsequent trek northwards, this handed the Abdali an almost two-year reprieve since the Battle of Sangan, giving them ample time to recover from that devastating loss. So by the time they learned that the Safavids were en route, they had managed to cobble together a 27,000 strong army, consisting mostly of cavalry, split between two commanders. 15,000 riders under Alayar Khan, the chieftain of the Abdali, who rode out from Herat to cut off Nader's approach to the city, with another detachment of 12,000, led by a brash commander by the name of Zalfakar Khan, galloping wildly, days away, coming from the south to join up with his counterpart. Nader and Alayar Khan, both leading their respective forces through a series of marches, feints and countermarches, the Abdali leader playing it coy and elusive, buying time to allow for Zulfikar Khan's arrival, with Nader, in contrast, aggressively pushing to instigate battle before the Abdali were able to unite their strength. Nader, eventually winning out in this chess game, finding Alayar Khan leading his troops north along the western banks of the Hari River, that today marks the border between Iran and Afghanistan, and Nader approaching south on the same side of the river. The two armies, after a few days of these marches and countermarches, finally coming face to face in a large plain just outside of a town called Kafarkala. Now, the benefit of meeting up here, in this location, was that Alayar Khan as well seemed to be fed up with trying to avoid battle, perhaps in order to not lose face amongst his men. But I believe, mainly because these lands were perfectly suited to the Afghan way of fighting, favoring cavalry combat. So yes, Nader did get his wish, but in doing so, he was taking a significant risk in this instance, because unlike the Battle of Sangan, there would be no time to dig in and prepare the battlefield, meaning that this was going to test the mettle of his infantry in a much more significant way who would be left out in the open against a ruinous wave of Afghan horsemen. Regardless, Nader was adamant on forcing the engagement, forming up his army with his musketmen across the center of the field, flanked by artillery on the wings and his cavalry in reserve, ready to swoop in when needed. Alayar Khan, in response, commanding almost all of his 15,000 horsemen to launch a fierce, all-out charge against the exposed Safavid infantry, and despite getting peppered with musket and cannonballs, enduring punishing casualties in their reckless frontal assaults, their overwhelming numbers deployed in the attack allowed them to break through to the Iranian infantry in some spots along the line and begin cleaving their way through, an action that could have very well evolved into a rout only prevented when Nader led his Kizilbash cavalry in to salvage the situation. By all accounts, viciously immersing himself into the melee and personally slaying a prominent Abdali officer, though at the cost of a spear that had pierced his right foot. The two armies, upon separating themselves from the initial day of fighting as night fell, quickly realizing that the Abdali warriors had suffered the far worst of the engagement, causing Aliyar Khan to wisely 
call for a short retreat to await the arrival of his countrymen, who were now just hours away. Safavid scouts scampering in and breathlessly bringing this news to Nader as well, which caused Nader to try another tactic, devising an ingenious ruse in order to prevent this, sending the bulk of his army south to get ready to meet Zulfikar Khan and his 12,000 horsemen in battle, while sending a smaller detachment of troops to flank Ali Khan's position. Interestingly though, not to attack, but rather strike up a boisterous battle victory tune, accompanied by cheers shouted by his men, to make it seem as though Zulfikar's men had been encountered and defeated, a ploy which, unbelievably, convinced Aliar to flee the area and head back to Herat, allowing Nader to concentrate his army on the approach of Zulfikar's fresh troops. However, as the two armies lined up across from one another, just about to give battle, Historical accounts speak of a huge dust and sandstorm that swept into the area, rendering battle impossible to continue. Also, foiling Nader's plan to take on each army piecemeal, since the storm provided the cover for Zulfikar to reach Herat and join with Aliar's contingent. With Nader, after the sandstorm had subsided, even though fully aware that the Abdali army was now united, outnumbering what he had in field, remained determined to press forward, marching straight towards Herat. Gaining sight of the city in the days that followed, finding the Abdali forces at the ready and positioned just outside of the city, the estimates for the opposing forces being just over 19,000 for the Safavids and 24,000 for the Abdali, again consisting mostly of cavalry but having also wheeled some artillery out of Herat to help with their cause against the Safavid force. That Nader had organized into a formation similar to what they had recently used at Kafar Kala. Infantry along the center, artillery at the edges, and the Kizilbash cavalry in reserve. The Abdali too, obliging with their typical tactics of charging straight out with their fierce warriors. However, one documented difference in this battle versus the earlier encounter at Kafar Kala is how well Nader's infantry performed. And it's not clear as to why. Maybe the lay of the land or the manner in which the Abdali launched their attacks. But the takeaway here is that the repeated Abdali charges in this fight were firmly halted by the Persian firepower, with absolutely no breaks in their lines experienced inflicting heavy casualties on their adversaries, that some have attributed to Nader taking command of the infantry and Jazayerchi himself, as a result of his earlier injury, which prevented him from fighting on horseback. Apparently, so dominant of a performance put on by the Safavid infantry that the Kizilbash cavalry were not called upon to bolster their lines, but rather commanded by Nader to charge out themselves harassing the retreating Abdali all the way to the city gates, with other detachments that sallied forth to capture the Abdali artillery pieces, which were then swiveled around and joined by the Persian cannons and mortars, all of which were then used to unleash an intense bombardment on the city of Herat, causing Ali Khan to send out envoys from the city to negotiate for peace in early July 1729. The terms, of course, all filtering through Nader, who ended up brokering the deal. Wherein Ali Khan was officially appointed as the governor of Herat, and the Abdali allowed to remain there, inhabiting the city and region, in exchange for acknowledging themselves as subject to Shah Tamasp and paying compensation for their rebellion. Both financial and what could be called a blood tax, meaning military conscription among the defeated resulting in a number of Abdali chiefs entering Tamasps and thus Nader's service. Approximately 5,000 exceptional Afghan cavalry added to the Safavid army, a much-needed injection to help with Nader's next objective, now that all of Khorasan and a number of its adjoining territories had been brought under control. Because just as Nader was putting the finishing touches on his masterful conquest of the Abdali in early July 1729, 
some 1,300 kilometers away to the west in Isfahan, the current ruler of Iran, Shah Ashraf Hotak, and his fearsome Gelzai Afghan cavalry were making final preparations to go on the march, headed straight for Khorasan, determined to crush the rogue Safavid prince and his new general that had been making so much noise in the northeast. Spies reporting in that Ashraf Hotak intended to conquer their base of operations at Mashhad, while Thomas ben Nader were abroad on campaign. Driving Nader, despite the veritable ink still being wet from signing off on the peace agreement with the Abdali, to urgently lead his army north, back to Mashhad before the arrival of the Hotaks. The Afghan-based dynasty that had seven years prior in 1722 toppled the Safavids from their seat of power. But since that point, as you may recall from the previous episode, had clearly bitten off more than they could chew in trying to hold on to and expand their holdings in Iran, largely attributed to the headwinds of never being truly accepted by most of the influential groups in Persian society as the legitimate rulers of Iran, due to their Afghan heritage and religious beliefs, adhering to Sunni versus Shia Islam, which dominated the landscape. Struggling with internal squabbling amongst themselves, heightened by Ashraf's assassination of Mahmud Hotak, thereby severing ties with the Hotak Afghan leadership in Kandahar, who stopped sending Gelzai warriors to help Ashraf keep his head above water. And finally, their notable lack of statecraft, the ability to transform their earlier military successes into building a lasting government, capable of administrating these lands they intended to rule instead resorting to increasingly harsher methods of asserting their authority. All of this adding up to an extremely difficult environment for the Hotaks to consolidate power in, while also steadily draining the strength of the Afghan military. A sentiment that Ali Jalali, in his book, Afghanistan, a military history from the ancient empires to the great game, puts best when he writes, During nearly eight years of occupation, Shah Mahmud Hotak and his successor, Shah Ashraf, faced dwindling resources and increasing public resentment against the Afghans' domination. Frustrated by increasing revolts and decreasing numbers in the occupation army, the Afghan leaders resorted to sheer force, brutality, and escalating violence. This is underscored by the point that although Ashraf Hotak had indeed taken on a sinking ship, he was widely recognized as being more than a capable military commander, having been one of the top Gelzai commanders that had allowed the Hotaks to come to power in the first place. And since usurping the Persian throne, had even managed to put a stop to the Ottoman Empire's advance, that, you may recall, had been opportunistically using the precarious and unstable situation in Iran to absorb more of its northwestern and western domains into theirs. This including most of the South Caucasus and the cities and regions of Tabriz, Hamadan, Kermanshah, and Loristan. Acquisitions that are quite significant, because these provided the Ottomans with footholds across the width of the Zagros mountain chain, overcoming this formidable geographical barrier from which they could later launch invasions deeper into Iran's interior when ready to do so, prevented, at least for the time being, by Ashraf Hotak, in 1727 leading his forces to win several engagements against the Ottomans, which in part spurred them to opt for a peaceful solution, signed in October 1727, called the Treaty of Hamadan, wherein the Ottomans, deterred from taking more, but satisfied with their land gains for the time being, were allowed to retain all their conquests to date. In exchange for recognizing Ashraf Hotak as the rightful Shah of Iran, and promising to support him in his bid to stay in control. Which may be leading you to think, Ottomans supporting the Hotaks? Weren't they just at each other's throats? And yes, that was indeed the case. However, This agreement made a great deal of sense for both parties, understanding the following. 1. And the more publicly stated reason being the role of religion. Like the Ottomans, the Hotaks also followed Sunni Islam, 
Therefore, among the leading religious authorities on both sides, there was a considerable amount of irritation that here they were, fighting brother against brother, when there were so many other important things to do in service to God, such as converting the Persian populace from Shiism to Sunni Islam. With the second, and certainly less PR-friendly version, being that this served the ambitions of both the Hotaks and Ottomans alike, particularly in view of what was appearing on the horizon, the revival of the Safavids, unfolding and gaining momentum under the guidance of its bold and obviously skilled new commander-in-chief. The Hotaks, for reasons already stated, in dire need of obtaining allies to help them stay in power. Whereas for the Ottomans, I believe that they much preferred Hotak rule of Iran over that of the Safavids, because there was the potential that if the Safavids were to regain control, from there they might be able to revive the united empire that had checked the Ottomans eastwards pushes for the last two centuries, while by contrast, they would have many more future opportunities to take land from the Hotaks since they would be highly unlikely to ever rule a united Persian empire, and thus remain a perpetually weaker foe. The more immediate benefit though, at least with respect to Shah Ashraf Hotak, was that in ending his conflict with the Ottomans, this freed him to concentrate his efforts on the aforementioned threat to his rule, the rising Safavid tide that was happening in Khorasan allowing Ashraf to organize an army and lead them in the direction of Mashhad, with the goal of ripping the region of Khorasan out from Tamas and Nadar's grasp, while they were away in campaign against the Abdali. In August 1729, Shah Ashraf leading a force of 30,000 out from the gates of Isfahan, marching towards the city of Semnan in northern Iran located around 200 kilometers east of the present-day capital of Tehran. Semnan being a holdout that had not yet fallen under Hotak domination, with Ashraf taking a roundabout route to get there, first north from Isfahan and then east, traveling along the edges of the vast desert called the Dasht-i Kavir, also known as the Great Salt Desert, which lies in the middle of the Iranian plateau. Like his Abdali counterparts, Ashraf's army consisting mainly of cavalry, headlined by his famed Afghan Gelzai warriors that had earlier eviscerated several much larger Persian armies. Yet despite their count dwindling, remained a formidable force, estimated at around 20,000 strong, accompanied by 10,000 Persian allied troops, mostly cavalry but also including some infantry and artillery. All setting off on this campaign centered around two main objectives, gaining control of territories in northern Iran still not under Hotak domination, such as the city of Semnan and its surrounding lands, and using this newly carved path to reach all the way to Mashhad and Khorasan, and put an end to the emerging Safavid threat. In its early stages, this campaign going exceedingly well for Ashraf, the size and might of his army causing any Persian dissidents encountered along the way to bow to him and join his ranks, which had increased to over 40,000 by the time he besieged the city of Semnon in mid-September 1729. Though, with one glaring error in his calculations, underestimating the sheer audacity and speed with which the Safavid army was now being pushed by the hand of its commander-in-chief. Nader, as mentioned a little earlier, while embroiled in battle against the Abdali, upon learning that Ashraf was making preparations to head their way, this drove him, out of necessity, to aggressively push for battle against the Abdali and complete the conquest of Harat at a quick pace. And once that business was concluded, almost immediately marches army back to Mashhad in anticipation of the Hotak's arrival getting back there by early August, with the Hotaks nowhere in sight, who were in fact still traveling en route to Semnon, causing Nader, instead of using all this time to prepare an elaborate defense at Mashhad, to boldly advance and take the larger Hotak army head-on, aiming to topple Ashraf Hotak from power 
and reinstate the Safavids to the throne, of course, with him firmly holding the reins in the background. Nader spending the next few weeks at Mashhad to briefly rest and reorganize his army, collect some new troops to replace the casualties they had incurred during the Abdali campaign, and then continue on, marching them west from Mashhad to Sabzavar. And from there, by mid-September, lead his army 400 kilometers further west, aiming at Semnon, understanding that Ashraf Hotak was bogged down there besieging the city. Nather's army numbering 25,000, 20,000 of which was in a similar, infantry-heavy configuration to what he had led into Herat, but now augmented by a large contingent of his own 5,000 Afghan cavalry, thanks to the Abdali's recent contribution. Though still considerably smaller than what Shah Ashraf was fielding, an enormous force of 40,000 plus, the vast majority of which were cavalry, who must have been surprised to learn the Safavids were directly headed his way, but reportedly quite happy to oblige giving battle, boasting that this would save him the trouble of heading all the way to Khorasan to erase the last remnants of the Safavid dynasty from existence. Ashraf, proceeding to leave a token force to keep the siege of Semnon going, his infantry and artillery contingents, while leading his 40,000 cavalry eastwards, supremely confident of his odds in a pitched battle. The Hotak and Safavid armies, coming into each other's view in late September 1729, near the small village of Memandust, the site that would later give this monumental battle its name, the Battle of Memandust also sometimes referred to as the Battle of Damgan, Damgan being the name of the largest nearby city. Bringing us to the events that we touched on at the very top of this episode, in the morning of September 29th, 1729, with the Safavids approaching the army of Shah Ashraf, his massive force of cavalry organized into three large divisions, situated across the width of the mountain valley, between the Alborz Mountains to the north and the lower-lying slopes to the south, marking the start of the dasht i kavir desert. With one interesting side note being that Ashraf was apparently so confident of victory that he didn't deploy his entire army for the battle, setting aside 3,000 of his horsemen to later hunt down and capture Tamas bin Nader after the engagement. As Nader led his troops into the field, infantry at the front acting as the vanguard to his army, seeing in person the overwhelming force of cavalry that was arrayed against them within the context of the natural geography of the area, particularly the slopes to the south. This caused the sharp-minded and quick-thinking Safavid commander to, on the spot, modify his strategy, looking to squeeze out the utmost benefits out of the landscape to accentuate the strengths of his forces but needing a diversion, buying him the time to allow for the setup desired. Nather proceeding to order approximately four to 5,000 of his multi-ethnic cavalry forward. Kizilbash, Kurdish, and Abdali units working in tandem to engage the Hotak's leftmost division, who responded by moving forward to begin a wild melee. Well, perhaps the more accurate description being a series of chases and skirmishes occurring all across the wide valley, a chaos of movement and violent bursts of action, unfolding exactly as Nader had intended. Because behind this initial thrust of Persian cavalry moving into the field was the rest of the Safavid army, the infantry and artillery units, that instead of moving into the battlefield closer to the Hotak army, marched back, then veered left, pivoting towards the low-lying hills to the south, making it seem as though Nader was leading his army in retreat, escaping into the hills. The reality being that all of this had just been an elaborate feint, acting as a cover to what Nader really had planned, who had absolutely no intentions of fleeing the battle, and was instead buying the precious time that he required to get his troops into position including all of his musket-bearing infantry formed into four divisions positioned at the foot of the hills, with Nader himself 
personally leading his elite Jazayerchi infantry. While the artillery, including the pieces taken from the Abdali, had been pulled up to the high ground, which must have been at a tremendous effort, but finally coming to rest behind and overlooking his infantry. And once all was set, neither then giving the signal for the Persian cavalry to suddenly melt away, reforming themselves to the far right and left of the infantry lines. And in case you're finding all of these movements difficult to envision, I'll include some visuals on my website that will be helpful to make sense of everything. Ashraf, once the dust had settled from this flurry of movement, finding the Safavid army assembled at the base of the hills, but still confident that they could be broken by the weight of his 40,000 horsemen that he commanded to charge out en masse, bringing to mind the terrifying and imposing sight of a horde of Afghan riders that surged forward, aiming at points all across the Persian line. That was met with an equally terrifying slew of artillery fire that tore through the front ranks of the incoming Hotak wave, cannon and mortar fire echoing throughout the valley, sharp booms that startled human and beast alike, followed by billowing smoke emitted from the Persian artillery positioned all along the hillside, resulting in an estimated three to 400 Afghan horsemen that fell to the initial barrage, followed by the Iranian artillery discharging again and again, their intense training paying off immense dividends, causing untold destruction among the Afghans, hundreds of casualties that multiplied into thousands making for an exceedingly grisly sight. Bodies of men and horses piling up, trampled by the Afghans that followed behind, more slowly now, having to navigate their way through the carnage of their fallen comrades, only to be met by hails of gunfire from the Iranian infantry that multiplied the Afghan losses further still, also forming a huge bottleneck that slowed their advance to a standstill with few Afghan horsemen able to reach the Iranian infantry divisions. Neither than unleashing another surprise, not the expected attack from his cavalry position on the wings of his army, but from the elite Jazayirchi that was commanded to leave their heavy muskets behind and surge forward through the center of the battlefield in a fierce counterattack, sabers and shamshirs drawn, with Nader leading them into the fray into the grounds that were now much more suited to infantry rather than mounted combat, and proceeding to decisively pierce and then cleave through the terribly disorganized Afghan army, that were shocked by the unorthodox turn of events, plus their seriously mounting casualties, and that ultimately caused them to fall back into retreat, though in part triggered by the makeup of the Hotak army, Ashraf's Persian allies which accounted for about 50% of his entire army and that were of dubious loyalty, unwilling to lay their lives down for the Afghan cause. The Battle of Meman Dust ending at a notably high cost to the Hotak forces. 12,000 left slain on the grounds of the battlefield, in contrast to three to 4,000 losses for Nader's army that were surprisingly light among the Jazayirchi but heavier among the Persian cavalry, largely due to their diversionary role in the opening frames of the battle. This victory, however, creating a palpable shift in the confidence and morale of the Safavid troops, raising this to an entirely new level. Put ever so eloquently by Herbert Maynard in his book, Nader Shah, when he writes, The Persians, who for seven years had tamely submitted as to a destiny to the tyranny of a body of men were suddenly awakened by the inspiring influence of their new leader to a sense of their own strength and the insignificance of their opponents. The Battle of Memondust destroyed the illusion which had represented the Afghans as invincible. A sentiment also beginning to dawn among the populace and governors of much of greater Iran once news of these events began to spread along with glowing recognition for the commander-in-chief, 
since it became widely known that Nather had solely engineered yet another unexpected victory for the Safavids, bringing him immense fame and a future handhold into the Safavid royal house. Being that, on the eve before battle, Shah Tamasp had promised Nather the hand of his sister in marriage, a Safavid princess by the name of Razia Begum Safavi, if the commander-in-chief managed to emerge victorious. Which sounds rather bizarre given their complicated relationship. However, although Tamasp was at times completely disgruntled, certainly not enjoying his servitude to Nather, the king in all but name. Nather, beyond being an exceptionally skilled battlefield commander, continued to do a masterful job of manipulating Tamasp, keeping him as a willing participant in their charade, in order to justify and legitimize his actions, while extracting more lands, titles, and now a Safavid princess from Tamasp, keeping him compliant by stringing him along, offering up countless promises to restore him to the throne, which now, more than ever, was inching towards reality, since, as mentioned, the tide was certainly beginning to change in Iran. Despite this and the devastating loss at Memandust, Ashraf Hotak managed to regain control of his army that was still quite sizable at 28,000, abandoning the siege at Semnon and lead them westwards, to reorganize and gather more troops for a renewed push against the Safavids. And to his credit, quickly learning the harsh lesson that the traditional Afghan tactics of using cavalry to overrun what the Persians were fielding was simply not going to cut it any longer. As the Hotaks made their way west from Memandust, Nader was relentless in his pursuit, aggressively marching to catch up with the Hotak army that Ashraf attempted to turn into an advantage. In early October, less than two weeks after Memandust, setting up an elaborate ambush at a site called Quar, a narrow mountain pass approximately 130 kilometers west of Semnon, that lay in the path towards the city of Tehran. Sadly, sources don't provide much insight as to the numbers involved in the ambush but it appears that Ashraf's commanders placed all of the available Hotak artillery pieces and musketeers, probably in the low thousands, redeployed from their failed siege at Semnon to be camouflaged, hidden from view, and positioned along the high ground overlooking the pass, in order to lay waste to the advancing Safavid column, with several thousand Hotak cavalry waiting just beyond the valley ready to rush in and exploit the anticipated Safavid confusion. A solid plan in theory. However, the Hotak officers didn't do a sufficient enough job of hiding their troops from view, because Nader scouts were able to spy out their positions and warn Nader far in advance as to what awaited them. This forewarning allowing Nader to come up with an inventive counter that would become a ruinous ambush of his own marching the bulk of his army towards Kuar Pass as if nothing were amiss. However, as the Hotak musketmen and artillery began preparing to deliver a battering of cannonballs and small arms fire upon the Safavid troops that were approaching below, they became assailed by a hail of musket fire at their backs, tearing into their ranks. Courtesy of the Iranian musketeer and Jazayirchi units, led by Nader himself, that had quietly peeled themselves off from the main army before it came into view of the valley and climbed up the narrow foothills leading up to the high ground from behind, delivering such a powerful and unexpected assault, catching the Afghans so completely off guard that they fell into a terrible disarray, with the few remaining survivors scrambling to escape to safety, which allowed Nader's forces to capture all of their artillery and the awaiting Afghan cavalry to scatter once they learned of what had unfolded. One interesting feature of note in the ambush or Battle of Kwar Pass as it became known is that Ashraf Hotak was absent during this fight, having rushed off to Isfahan, following the disaster at Memandust to brutally squash any budding excitement that was developing among the inhabitants once they learned of what had happened and any thoughts that they had about trying to overthrow the Afghan leadership. 
also using this time to assemble a more powerful army than ever. Ashraf playing the supremely powerful ace up his sleeve, imploring for the intervention of the Ottomans as an ally in his fight against the Safavids, who, as referenced earlier, also had a vested interest in preventing the revival. Ashraf Hotak sending a flurry of urgent envoys to the Ottoman governor in Baghdad, invoking the terms set within the Treaty of Hamadan, requesting military aid for their next showdown with the Safavid army. The Ottomans immediately honoring the agreement and quickly responding by sending an enormous force of 30,000 musketmen and 250 artillery pieces, dramatically inflating Ashraf's army to almost 60,000, all of which marched out north from Isfahan in early November 1729, landing at a village called Morshkort, about 50 kilometers north of Isfahan where they began making preparations for the Safavids' arrival. Now, as a quick aside, I have to include here that there is a great deal of conflicting information on this figure of 30,000 infantry sent by the Ottomans, some accounts stating that they only sent the muskets, which were then forced into the hands of Persians that were pressed into the Hotak's army. And while feasible... I tend to doubt that Ashraf would have been able to do this under the time frame he was dealing with. Plus, he was an astute enough commander to know that putting these weapons in the hands of untested and untrained people, forcing them to do so no less, would have invariably worked against him in the upcoming battle. As such, I tend to believe that it was indeed Ottoman infantry that was sent, but still of questionable quality more so militia-type units, and certainly not the Janissaries, the elite infantry that made up the core of the fearsome Ottoman military machine. Which would have come in extremely handy in view of Nather's army that was headed straight for them at the village of Morshkort. After having liberated the city of Tehran from the Afghans, who fled the region after the failed ambush at Kwar Pass, also allowing the Safavids to replace the heavy cavalry losses it had incurred at the Battle of Memondust. Several thousand Persian cavalry gained, bringing Nather's army back to a fighting weight of approximately 25,000. This brief interlude at Tehran being one of serious contention between Tamasp and Nader, since Tamaspa was impatient and wanted to march immediately on Isfahan after the engagement at Kwar Pass whereas Nather wanted to secure Tehran and use the time to replace their heavy cavalry losses. A wise calculation that would prove to be the difference maker in the next battle. And despite learning of the massive force that awaited them at Murshkort, Nather nonetheless decided to press on and meet the Hotaks in battle. Where, upon arriving at the village that would later give this decisive encounter its name, the Battle of Murshkort. It became clear that Ashraf had taken the harsh lessons from their earlier encounter to heart, understanding that a frontal assault would be his undoing. Accordingly, when Ashraf arrived at Murshkort, awaiting the arrival of the Safavids, in a very Nader-like fashion, reminiscent of the defensive stance that he had used against the Abdali at the Battle of Sangan in 1727, Ashraf organized all of his 30,000 Ottoman allied musketmen into one solid linear block within defensive trenches, supported by the 250 pieces of Ottoman artillery, some of which were placed in front of and behind the long line of infantry, along with 30,000 cavalry, split evenly into two wings that protected the left and right flanks of his army. Though, as a quick side note, it was only around 10,000 Galzai cavalry that were left by this point. And in a strange turn of the tables, this being the first time in a long while that it was a Safavid army approaching a well-dug-in foe, one that outnumbered them more than two to one no less. And so, observing this, Nather attempted several feints over the next few days, trying to coax the Hotak army out of their strong defensive stance. But wisely, Ashraf calling every one of his bluffs and ordering his troops to remain where they were. Meaning that, if Nather wanted a battle to happen, he was going to have to attack. Resulting in the commander-in-chief proceeding to arrange his 25,000 troops in the following fashion. 
Nather personally leading his Jazayarchi, alongside his regulars, in total 15,000 strong, that were arrayed in a thinner but equally long line across from the entrenched Ottoman infantry. The Persian field artillery, positioned at intervals and in between the infantry, but setting their sights on the opposing Ottoman artillery placements. And lastly, his multi-ethnic force of 10,000 cavalry that Nader had subdivided into three divisions, one protecting the right flank and two positioned to the far left of his army. Opposite the Afghan right, where Ashraf had placed the Galzai horsemen, Nader wagering that this is where the Afghans would be strongest, therefore needing more weight to keep them in check. In the early morning of November 12, 1729, Nader giving the signal and initiating battle, ordering his artillery to concentrate their fire on the Ottoman artillery positions, limiting their ability to inflict casualties on the main source of the Safavid attack. Like at Memandust, commanding his infantry all across the Persian center to move forward at a steady pace. The regular musketeers and Nader at the head of his elite Jazayirchi promptly advancing without hesitation, but stopping short of the entrenched Ottoman infantry, setting up and beginning to fire at their adversaries. Their overall training and the superior range of the Jazayir muskets in particular, granting them immense advantages here, since the distance at which they stopped away from their adversaries allowed them to hit the Ottomans with a great deal of success, despite their defenses, inflicting an alarmingly high rate of casualties, whereas the Ottomans were barely able to hit Nader's troops. Ashraf Hotak, seeing with worry what was happening all along the center, sending his cavalry wings forward to attempt cutting into both sides of the Persian infantry line. However, these charges were quickly intercepted by the awaiting Persian cavalry. Even on the far right of the Afghan line, where the Galzai riders had been situated, pockets of intense fighting breaking out all over the battlefield. Time and time again, the Afghan cavalry wings attempting to crash through to the middle of the field, but every single time being met by Nather's cavalry that were fighting a purely defensive engagement desperately trying to make sure that the Persian infantry were well protected at all cost. All along the center, clouds of white smoke billowing in the air where the Persians and Ottomans continued to pepper each other with musket fire, with the Ottomans seeing the far worse of the engagement, threatening to break at several points along the line. Both Nadr and Ashraf from their vantage points seeing this, but creating two very different reactions. Nader, giving the signal for his infantry to leave their muskets behind, pull out their sabers and shamshir swords and charge forward into the Ottoman line. A charge led by Nader and the Jazayirchi, some meeting their foes just outside the trench, some dropping into the trenches in pursuit of their adversaries. The two organized lines of infantry crashing into one another in a tangled mess, a brutal explosion of vicious and personal melees, and rapidly growing abundantly clear that these Ottoman infantry were no match for Nader's exceptionally trained and disciplined soldiers. That had caused the opposing Ottomans to bend under the weight of their musket fire, before being broken by their unwavering charge, causing Ashraf Hotak from his vantage point to come to the grim realization that the loss in battle was imminent and irreparable, with his hold on Iran fleeting by the second confirmed beyond the shadow of a doubt as the Persians broke through the Ottoman line, triggering a full-scale collapse of the Hotak army, their cavalry scattering in all directions and the Ottomans surrendering in full, marking the end of the Battle of Murshkort, an overwhelming and decisive victory for Nader's army that saw extremely light casualties in the low hundreds in comparison to estimates of seven to 8,000 losses for the Hotak Ottoman Allied Army. These moments also forming the last minutes of the Hotak Dynasty's rulership of Iran, with Ashraf collecting the remnants of his Galzai, whittled down to around 5,000 by now, and fleeing the field, galloping wildly to Isfahan, arriving there that very evening, not to prepare for a defense of the city, but to scramble for valuables and load them onto as many four-legged beasts as he could find.
before fleeing the city that same night, heading into southern Iran. While back at Murshkort, Nader had to sift through the wreckage of the Hotak army, in particular accepting the surrender of the Ottoman troops, relieving them of their arms and artillery, but pragmatically sending them home unharmed, so as to avoid triggering a war with Iran's behemoth neighbor to the west, as they were simply not ready for such a task, at least not yet. And with that business completed, Nader then leaving Tamas behind at Morsh Court, and making straight for Isfahan at the head of his Kizilbash to secure the city, finding Ashraf Hotak gone, and its gate swung wide open for the Safavid commander-in-chief, who entered Isfahan on November 16, 1729, reclaiming the capital city of the Iranian Empire on behalf of the Safavid dynasty, and then immediately got to work restoring order in the city, ending the looting and mob violence that had gripped its streets while his troops also searched for any Afghans hiding throughout the city, any found facing the dismal fate of being dragged out into the streets and massacred without mercy. Another occurrence of note being what happened at the tomb of Mahmud Hotak, the founder of the Hotak dynasty in Iran that had conquered Isfahan seven years prior in 1722, which became a target of the mob's rage, tearing it apart and afterwards becoming home to a public toilet. And once Nader managed to fully restore order in the city, he then summoned Shah Tamasp to enter the capital in a carefully choreographed ceremony of triumph. In late November 1729, Tamasp, finding Nader awaiting his arrival outside the main gates of the city, dismounting from his horse in a public show of deep respect and gratitude to his quote-unquote faithful servant, before walking together through the gates, symbolically more akin to equals rather than king and subject, rather than motioning to his king to remount his steed and lead the way to the palace, to the jubilation of Isfahan's inhabitants. Tamasp, upon entering the once ostentatious palace grounds, finding it in a dismal condition and gutted of its riches, which reportedly brought the Shah to tears. And come to think of it, is a rather accurate symbol of what the Safavid dynasty had become, a shell of its former authority and self, with Tamasp as nothing more than a figurehead, the Shah in name only, servant to Nader. And while the inhabitants at that point may have been unaware of the true state of dynamics between them, rumors would soon begin spreading as to the real relationship, in part, driven by Nader's firm grasp on the loyalty of the Iranian army, all of whom were aware that Nader alone was the source of power behind the throne, a notion that would undoubtedly become clear to all in the weeks that followed, especially during the subsequent royal court proceedings. More carefully crafted displays of theater, including one instance where Nader requested leave to return to Khorasan, obviously having no intention to do so, but nonetheless, getting Tamasp to practically beg him to remain at his side, assisting with setting the empire to rights. A role which Nader threw himself into, spending the next weeks and months assisting by demanding that all matters of state and royal administrators go through him. Tamasp not even given license to choose his own servants, like before, all of this being selected for him to maintain his political isolation while Nader also made sure to restock the royal harem with concubines and other distractions to keep the Shah occupied, and most importantly, from meddling in the affairs of the empire. Nader's affairs, including chasing down Ashraf Hotak who was on the run, reining in any regional governors who had thoughts of remaining independent, and filling important administrative positions and roles with people loyal to Nader and what could only be described as a royal wedding, Tamas delivering on the promise he had made to Nader on the eve of the Battle of Memandust, granting him the hand of his sister in marriage, the Safavid princess Razia Begum Safavi, a union that would later produce the youngest two of Nader's four sons, Imam Koli Mirza, born around 1730, and in 1736, Mustafa Ali Mirza quite the fascinating historical figure 
who would much later assume the name Joseph von Semlin, serving in the Austrian and Russian armies during the late 1700s. But what of Nader's other wife, you might be thinking? Baba Ali Beg's second daughter that had given him the first of his two sons, as mentioned in the last episode. Sadly, historical accounts don't provide any insights as to what happened to her. So it could be that she passed away by this point, or remained as Nader's spouse left behind in Khorasan. However, this unfortunately remains a mystery, since there is simply no further mention of her in the sources that I encountered. But what is more certain is that this Safavid princess would become fully devoted to her new husband, wielding significant influence in palace affairs during Nader's absences from Isfahan, while also bolstering Nader's stature and public profile. And, although much more strengthened by this point, remained insufficient for legitimizing Nader's desire to secure the crown for himself. The timing, not quite right for this yet, especially since much of Iran was still so deeply fragmented and unstable. The revived Safavid Iranian Empire facing problems aplenty, these including the Russian Imperial Empire that continued to occupy territories in northwestern Iran, the remnants of the Hotak dynasty that needed to be dealt with and served retribution for their brutal takeover and rule, both Ashraf Hotak who was on the run in southern Iran and Hussein Hotak, the king in Kandahar. There was also a bubbling Abdali rebellion that was beginning to surface in Herat, due to an internal power struggle among the tribal chieftains, threatening to nullify the recent agreement Nader had made with them. A considerable list, topped off by the Ottoman Empire, that still held huge portions of western and northwestern Iran, showing signs of eagerly trying to grasp for more. Clearly, Nader had more than enough to keep him busy in the goal of continuing to steer his nation away from the rocks. A purposeful statement used here, since, make no mistake, the Iranian Empire was definitely his now. And in order to keep it that way, just as he affirmed his rise to where he was now, the scaling up of the Persian military was going to play a critical role in these endeavors. Nather proceeding to divert the trickle of state funds, since the economy was largely in shambles now after all the recent strife and warring, to be poured into the expansion of the Persian army, especially in terms of small arm firearms and artillery. No expense spared in obtaining the very best of materials and equipment available, even going to the extent to outfit his cavalry with chainmail and metal plate armor while also subjecting both new recruits and the veteran soldiers to the usual and intense routine of training, drilling, and discipline that had become commonplace in the ruthlessly effective army he had built. The 25,000 strong army that had come through relatively unscathed after the Battle of Murskort, containing veterans from no less than at least seven major battles and sieges, and countless skirmishes since the Battle of Sangan which feels like it was a lifetime ago compared to this point in the storyline, but, in fact, had only been two short years. However, regardless of his many successes thus far, due to the long list of immediate problems facing Iran, these were pressing upon Nader to take immediate action, and he wouldn't be able to wait for the expansion of his army, which would take some time to build up. Accordingly, after about two months in Isfahan, successfully binding the Persian Empire closer to his will, the commander-in-chief readied his 25,000 troops and led them off 500 kilometers to the south to the city of Shiraz, meeting and absolutely smashing the tattered remains of Ashraf Hotak's army, while also reasserting the centralized authority of the Safavids wherever he went. As to Ashraf Hotak's fate, the encounter at Shiraz would be his last, meager attempt to regain Iran. The encounter rendering him near penniless and with a small group of guards, forced to flee back towards Kandahar, the Afghan stronghold under the leadership of Shah Hussein Hotak, who upon learning that Ashraf was attempting to make his way back into his realm in 1730, due to the pre-existing bad blood between them, had him executed. With Nader then, 
after having finally dealt with Ashraf Hotak for good, pausing for mere moments before looking westwards towards the Ottoman Empire in March 1730. Daring to take on the perennial arch-rival of the Persian Empire, that had time and time again, as now, encroached on their lands. Though one considerable unknown in this equation was that Nader's army and military system was originally designed for taking on the likes of the Abdali and Galzai, that almost exclusively relied on cavalry, using overwhelming musket and artillery fire to mow them down. And while the Battle of Morshkort had been the exception to this, showing hints of his forces being able to shine against opposing infantry and artillery, those Ottoman troops encountered had been of dubious quality. And the Ottomans also had much deeper pockets in terms of military resources and strength than what he could hope to field. It would be an altogether different story and test in facing the armies of the Ottomans alone. That in many ways mirrored Nader's military formulation. But having been fighting in this fashion for far, far longer, well over 200 years, in fact, having been its originators, Regardless, Nather was determined on pursuing this path, and I am now convinced, given what we have learned of this brilliant battlefield commander thus far, that in undertaking this war, if he were to prove successful, Nather understood that this would continue to galvanize his growing stature, a decidedly far cry from the insignificant youth he had been. In time, perhaps providing him with enough credit to cast aside his current existence as the power behind the throne and rise officially as Shah. In the next episode, we'll follow along as Nader embarks on an audacious and lightning campaign against the Ottomans, displaying further evidence of his tactical genius to rack up more scintillating victories and ultimately push the Ottomans out of the Iranian domains almost all along the west. Prevented from completing this due to the Afghan Abdali tribe again arising up in a dangerous rebellion at Herat, forcing Nader to abandon his campaign against the Ottomans and race across the width of the empire to tame them for good, setting the stage for a series of severe setbacks. His prolonged absences giving space for his puppet king, Shah Tamasp, to reclaim power at Isfahan in the attempt to break his servitude to Nader and emerge out of the long shadow that his commander-in-chief was casting by assuming control of the troops in the western portion of the Iranian Empire and marching them off to finish what Nader had started against the Ottomans, but presiding over a disastrous campaign and forced into handing back all the territories that Nader had recently recaptured, throwing Nader into an incensed rage, who then devises another piece of theater to force Tamasp into abdicating the throne, replaced by his infant son, with Nader entrenched as regent, and from there restart hostilities with the Ottomans, but is soon dealt a devastating loss in battle, throwing his future into doubt. Nader's iron will, however, driving him to rise up again against tremendous odds, out of the devastation, and although outnumbered more than 5 to 1, to deliver a stunning blow against the Ottomans at the Battle of Yagvard in 1735, bringing the Ottoman Empire to its knees, and setting the stage for the establishment of the Afsharid Iranian Empire, with Nader as Shah. This and more to come in the next episode of the Warlords of History podcast. If you want to support the podcast, there are many ways you can do so. You can tell your family and friends about the show. Please rate, review, and subscribe on whichever platform you happen to access the show on. You can follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. And lastly, you can head over to the show's website, warlordsofhistory.com, where I'll include some additional info like images and maps pertaining to this episode for your viewing pleasure, and where you can also reach out to me with any thoughts, questions, or suggestions. I would love to hear from you. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the episode.
Theme music from Audionautics.com.